Well, on behalf of Intertanko, Apostle Lissa, I thank you for inviting me to come to speak at this conference about uh, ballast water management. Um, ballast water management is probably one of the biggest environmental issues facing the entire shipping industry, not just the tanker industry, but the entire shipping industry. Now, Apostolos has given me a very tight timeline, 15 minutes. I have a screen that's timed already. So I'm going to skip all the jokes and get right into the presentation about what's going on. But before I do that, of course, I always have to give you a little bit of propaganda. Uh, for those of you that don't know, what is Intertanko? It is the International Association of Independent Tanker Owners. It's a nonprofit uh, shipping association whose aims are to work for the safe, safety of sea, protection of the environment, to further the interest of the independent tanker owners, and to promote the free and competitive trade of the tanker operators. For those of you that are interested, we have two types of membership. Membership is open, obviously full membership, to the independent tanker owners. This does not include the oil companies or the state-owned companies, but purely only the independent tanker owners. But then we have associate members, and this is open to all that are interested in shipping. And we have quite a few, uh, more than 300 associate members. So if you see something here that I present today about ballast water that you think may be of interest to you, you might want to look into becoming an associate member to learn more about this. Uh, we do have, Intertanko two years ago developed a five-year strategic plan. And that plan included eight specific issues that were of most importance to our members. And one of them was ballast water. Uh, the desired outcome that we wanted to achieve for our members on ballast water was to allow them to comply with the current and future discharge standards, whether they be international or domestic or regional. And to do that, we focused on two issues making sure that our members could install and operate the appropriate adequate equipment on board their ships, and number two, making sure that they could comply and it would be enforced properly and equitably throughout the world. So in doing so, to give you this presentation, I want to address two specific areas, the major areas where ballast water is of concern. Obviously, the first one is at IMO. I'll talk about the developments that have gone on there and what Intertanko has specifically done to help the shipping industry in this area. And then I'll get specific as to what's going on in the United States, both from a standpoint of the U.S. Coast Guard and from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. First, let's talk about the international treaty. We have a ballast water management treaty that was adopted at IMO 10 years ago in 2004. For this treaty to enter into force, it required 30 countries representing 35% of the world's gross tonnage. Where do we stand right now? 38 countries, so the number is met, but not the tonnage. Four countries, Bahamas, Panama, Singapore, and the UK, each one by themselves, if they were to ratify, would bring this treaty into force. We have spoken to each of them. Bahamas, Panama, and the UK have made it very clear to us they don't intend to do it anytime soon. Singapore, we're not sure. So it could happen this year, and if it does, the convention would enter into force a year later. Back in May of 2012, our council met our policy setting body, and they told us, the Secretariat, to develop a comprehensive document to go to IMO to identify the challenges that we have in complying with the treaty. So we made a submission to IMO in October of 2012 to address four major issues the actual guidelines for the approval of the equipment, the scheduling for the installation of the equipment, the port state control procedures, and then the surveying of the equipment. Let me touch base on each of them. And I should mention, the submission that we made was not just an Intertanko submission. It was jointly submitted by a whole array of shipping associations, as well as Panama, the Marshall Islands, and um, Liberia. So a number of flag states were involved in this also. Very quickly, what did they decide? Well, at that meeting, they decided they would not revise the guidelines for uh, approving the equipment, which was a disappointment to us. They did come up with some additional guidelines for transparency and things like that, but not exactly what we wanted. They did decide to develop an assembly resolution to see what could be done about the scheduling, and they did agree with the Intertanko submission that the port state control procedures should be no more rigorous than the approval process procedures, which was very important. Finally, with regard to survey and certification, 
That was a minor administrative thing to make sure all ships could be surveyed, and that was resolved with a circular. A little more detail on these. The outcome, the implementation schedule, led by Jap a correspondence group led by Japan at the IMO assembly in November of last year. They did adopt the resolution. This was very good news, we feel, not only for Intertanko members, but for the shipping industry. Basically, the implementation of the convention will be based upon the entry into force date. It's still an unknown, but once we know we have the required tonnage, we will know what will enter into force one year later, and we can start scheduling. Most importantly, that resolution declares that all ships are considered existing ships up until that entry into force date. And the benefit of that then is that all ships up until that date would then have up until the renewal survey after that date to put the equipment on board. So once the convention is ratified, one year later it enters into force, and then by the renewal survey after that is when the equipment must be installed under the IMO regime. Turning to port state control, another good story. What the IMO has agreed to is a trial period, initially two to three years following entry into force to get experience in port state control with ballast water man man management systems. And during that period, it was agreed that member states would refrain from detaining ships or initiating control actions on ships. Very positive there too, except of course you see for the footnote. The US Coast Guard said they would not be bound by that. So going to the US, there will not be any refraining from penalties. There's still some disagreement on the exact procedures, but that's being worked out. The big issue right now, ballast water manner approvals. As I mentioned, there was some progress. They did develop some guidelines for transparency, but we felt that was not enough. And our council last year said we, they wanted us to go back to IMO and get the IMO to revise the G8 guidelines, the actual approval guidelines. Working together with other shipping associations, we did make a submission to this last MEPC meeting, which met just last week. And we wanted to amend the guidelines to address a number of issues the salinity, the temperature, the sediment, the flow rates. We wanted to make sure there was a protection for those ship owners that had put equipment on board. So we wanted to have a grandfather clause included, which we thought was very reasonable. And thirdly, we wanted to submit this paper to send a signal to the flag states, hey, maybe you shouldn't rush to ratify this convention too soon. There are still some problems. Unfortunately, the outcome last week was disappointing. The IMO member states did not agree with this industry proposal. I would say there was a lot of support. A lot of developing countries, a lot of the open registries supported what we wanted, but uh, mostly Northern European countries spoke very loudly against this. U.S. Coast Guard stayed quiet, by the way. Did not say a thing on this. So we were not successful. Um, instead of agreeing with what we wanted, they said they'll do a study to explore what we were saying, and that could take two, three, four years, we're not sure. So. We, the industry associations, decided what we're going to do is we are going to make another submission. We're not going to let up on this. We're going to make another submission to the next MEPC, which will meet in October. And at that meeting, we're going to propose a schedule, a timeline, a roadmap on what we think ought to be done. The other comment I would make on this, you may have seen, yesterday we issued a press release. All the major shipping associations issued a press release saying we're seriously concerned about the implementation of this ballast water treaty. The IMO did not respond to our concerns at this meeting. And in that press release, we are saying we therefore cannot recommend to any flag state to further ratify this treaty. We thought that was an important step. Turning now to the US. I still have five minutes, OK. Turning now to the US. US Coast Guard first. Well, they issued some regulations back in March of 2012. The requirements are kind of outlined them there. You have to do ballast water discharge. You have to have a plan and a record book. On a positive note, the ballast water discharge standard is the same that's in IMO. So that was very good to see. The compliance schedule that they put out was very, very similar to what was in the IMO convention. However, now that we have the assembly resolution, which modifies that schedule, the Coast Guard has made it clear they're not going to be using that schedule. They will still be sticking to their schedule. So in effect, ships will have to start complying to what the Coast Guard regulations say. 
On another positive note, though, they did come up with something called an alternative management system. So an owner that puts on a system that's approved uh, under an IMO scheme, which is type approved by your flag state, they will accept that on your ship for five years. They're hoping and they're expecting between now and those five years, though, they will have a Coast Guard approved system. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but an important point to mention, if you do not discharge ballast water into U.S. waters, so if your ship is only going there to load cargo, okay, I'm sorry, discharge cargo, you're not going to have to load, uh, have a ballast water system on board. So keep that in mind as you go through the U.S. And finally, also of a very positive note, the Coast Guard is granting extensions to those people or those ship owners that feel they uh, don't or cannot put a ballast water system on board. And I'll talk about that in a second. Now, what has Intertanko done to our system members in dealing with these Coast Guard regulations? Well, the first thing we did in working with the Coast Guard is we developed a decision tree. It may be difficult to read here, but our members can read this on our website. And if you'd like to join Intertanko, you can read it on our website there. Basically, what it does at the top, it breaks it off into two branches. When was your ship built? If it was built before December of 2013, you go one way. After, you go another way. You then come down, do you have a ballast water system on board? If so, is it AMS approved by the Coast Guard? And et cetera, et cetera. And it tells you what you must do to comply with the Coast Guard regulations when going into U.S. waters. We found this to be very helpful to our members. The Coast Guard has said they thought it was correct and helpful also. So I commend that to you if you think it would be helpful to you. The other thing we've done, a number of our members wanted to request extensions from the Coast Guard. So we developed a model extension request letter, also available on our website, where they can go to the website, take this letter, fill in the blanks, and then submit to the Coast Guard this extension letter to get the request. And finally, we've also worked with the, class, the Coast Guard. As you may have seen in my bio, I used to work for the Coast Guard, so I have good contacts there. And they helped clarify a number of issues on concerns our members have, and they still do. And these are just some of the things that they've pointed out. <coughs> just a little bit of few comments on this extensions and the ballast water approval in the Coast Guard. They have recently granted over 100 extensions to ships whose dry docking was due in 2014, in this year. That's as far as they've gone. They have a number of requests for beyond that, but right now they're holding off on granting those extensions. The reason they're holding off is they want to get a Coast Guard approved system as soon as they can, so that way, once they have a Coast Guard approved system, they can then decide upon what date ships must have that on board and stop granting exemption, extensions. But right now, they don't have that, so they don't know. Uh, they chose this January 2016 date and not the first dry docking after that date to try to hold the ship owners uh, as rigorously as possible to the date and hopefully encouraging ship owners to put pressure on the ballast water manufacturers to go through the Coast Guard process and get their system Coast Guard approved. We'll see how successful they are. Um, they also have indicated it may not need to be done in dry dock. This is what some of the manufacturers are telling them. So the Coast Guard's waiting on that one too. And we'll see how that develops. One last item on the Coast Guard, what's going on with their approval process? What we've been told is that there are a few ballast water manufacturers who are aggressively pursuing approval through their system. They will not tell us which ones. They expect to have a system approved, they say, by early next year. We'll see what happens. They've also indicated, we've brought to their attention, if one is approved and they make that available, it creates a monopoly and a problem. They say they understand that problem, but they're not going to wait too long before the second one comes or the third one. They've also indicated that they'll look at the schedule and they'll try and come up with something what they call pragmatic on how best to ensure all ships coming to the U.S. will have to have a Coast Guard approved system on board. Finally, just turning to the EPA, because there's a second shoe that drops here in the U.S., the U.S. EPA requirements. To a large extent, the U.S. EPA requirements are the same as the Coast Guards, which was, we were good to see. They don't require the ballast water system be approved to comply with their regulations. So an AMS that the Coast Guard accepts is acceptable to EPA. They do require some monitoring on their ships for the ballast water system, which the Coast Guard does not require. Okay, I sit down now? Or can I finish? Let me just finish up. Okay. 
The biggest problem is the EPA is not granting extensions. They are not granting extensions. So we, we knew they, we discussed this with them. They realized it was a problem. So they came out with a policy letter with the Coast Guard and said that if the Coast Guard grants an extension to a vessel, and if that vessel is in full compliance in all other ways, then they will treat that as non-compliance, but they will treat it as a low enforcement priority. Remains to be seen what they do with that. With that, I say thank you. I almost made it.